grew up in Birkenhead. Yes. Um, we don't have to talk about that, do we? <laughs> no. Well, some, some people had to grow up there. Yes. Um, did you always want to be a writer? And what was it like to have writing aspirations coming from no. Birkenhead? Did I always want to be a writer? Um, no. Uh, but that was because I, I didn't know what I wanted to be, like most young people. Um, I discovered that I wanted to be a writer one afternoon. Um, I left school at 16 with very little. I was a guitarist originally, and um, I played with various people and uh, didn't really make any money. Um, and when I was 19, I decided to be sensible. <laughs> One of many times I've decided to be sensible. And I went and trained as a drama teacher at Leeds. Um, I managed to talk my way in with four O-levels on the basis that I claimed to be a mature student, 19. Um, but they were liberal and they let me in. And on the last day, the very, very last day I was there, we had a visit from the playwright, now rather forgotten, um, Trevor Griffiths. And having spent three years studying drama, I suddenly realised I'd never actually encountered a playwright. I'd read a lot of plays, um, never, never seen a playwright in the flesh. Trevor Griffiths, I hope, would forgive me for saying he's, he's a very unprepossessing figure. But the moment he started to talk, I just knew that's, that's what I wanted to be. I, I want to be like you. That was that moment. So I was very, very lucky at uh, um, 22, as I was then. I was very, very lucky because I knew from that moment on what I wanted to do in life. I didn't quite know what form it was going to take. I thought I was going to have to write plays for the theatre, which I did for a, a little while, um, before the evil tentacles of television <laughs> reached out. So on the subject of evil tentacles of television, what, would you, what do you consider your first big break? Um, well, this was one of them. Um, it's often said, if you look on Doctor Who websites um, though, about me, that uh, I, I hadn't done anything at all before Silver Nemesis. That's, that's not true. Um, I had I'd written three plays for the theatre, um, and I had done three or four episodes of different, different drama series. Um, the first one uh, was probably my big break. It was, it was um, I'm sure nobody will remember it now. You're all far too young. But uh, it was the last episode of an ITV series called Wish Me Luck, which was about women in the French resistance. And um, I have to be very careful how I say this. Um, it could be argued that the person who gave me the job did so because he had nicked um, one of my plays and turned it into quite a successful film. It could be argued, <laughs> only by cynics. But that was my big break. Um, I'm led to believe that you'd, you went on the BBC Writers' Training Course. Oh, God, yes. Um, <laughs> You're better informed than I am. <laughs> I did warn you, didn't yeah, I? Thank you. No, this um, is good. What was that yes, like and what did it entail? That was amazing, actually. That was amazing. They don't do it anymore and it, it, they should do. Um, it didn't actually last very long. Maybe, maybe once they, they saw the result, they decided not to. But uh, <laughs> it was it was a week of um, of activities, which I'll describe in a moment. But it it was uh, uh, you. I don't think you actually applied. I think you you were put forward, um, and because I had a. Uh, Actually, I should have said, big break. My big break was getting my first wonderful agent, Rod Hall. Um, Rod was tragically murdered a few years ago, you may remember, having seen it in the papers. Um, but uh, Rod uh, took me out of the Fringe Theatre and uh, pushed and pushed, did what an agent should do. I've never had one since who was half as good. Um, and he pushed and pushed, and so people from the BBC came to see my first fringe theatre play, um, and they um, liked it enough, and two of them put me forward for, the, uh, uh, for this course, which happened to be coming up. You see, a bit of luck. It was the first time the BBC had done it, um, and they gave us a week, and because they'd never done it before, um, they... Uh, they sort of threw everything at it. I mean, Michael Grade was running the BBC in those days. We had a, a morning. There were seven of us. 
We had a morning with Michael Grade. It was us and Michael Grade. Um, and he talked to us about television, making television. Um, and we, could, you know, we asked him questions. And I, I mean, you, you couldn't get better than that in those days. We had the wonderful, wonderful, um, my mentor, I suppose, um, the late Alan Plater. You may remember Alan Plater. Um, I mean, Alan Plater was one of the people who invented television script writing, Z cars and all that. Um, I mean, there hadn't been any before then. And uh, Alan was, was, to the end of his days, uh, Alan was, was always so approachable and uh, gentle and helpful. And, you know, when you're, when you're starting as a, as a writer or, you know, when you're young and you're starting your working life in any sphere, you're not as confident as you like to appear. Um, and I, I think any form of artist, any form of performer, you are very vulnerable, actually. You know, young, young performers and musicians or whatever, you are very vulnerable. Um, and, of course, uh, easily, easily bruised, easily put off. Um, and Alan, that was Alan, again, one of the leaders of the game who couldn't have been nicer, couldn't have been more helpful, um, and uh, funnily enough, I, about a year before he died, I, um, I used to go, my wife doesn't like jazz, but my mother-in-law does. Uh, so uh, my mother-in-law and I, I don't Steady care, night. We, night. Go, <laughs> we go to jazz gigs together, right? I, 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 there we are, it's out, it's in the open. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're, we went to see, um, oh, anyway, whoever it was, um, Winter Marsalis at, uh, at the festival hall. And um, so we get in our seats, and there is in the seats in front of us is Alan and uh, his wife. So uh, it was so nice. We had a long, long talk and so on. And I told him, not for the first time, how, how very much um, his support, his help had meant to me. And I'm very glad I did, because I never saw him again. Uh, the other person, may I cue myself in? Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel guilty about this. Uh, I never quite told um, how grateful I was for the big break he gave me was John Nathan Turner, um, who produced the show we're here to, to celebrate. Um, gets a mixed press, John, but uh, he was a great, great guy, a great guy. He didn't suffer fools. He gave the most fantastic parties. John would throw a party in his office at the drop of a hat. You know. <laughs> He'd be you know, uncorking away. I say, isn't this great? It's why everybody's so glad to pay the license fee. <laughs> Controversial, that. Controversial. Yes. Um, well, on the subject of John Nathan Turner, I'm, I'm led to believe that he may have shouted at you. <laughs> I wondered what you were going to say. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah I... <laughs> We didn't publish there are, that. There book. are rumours, you know. <laughs> there are rumors. Yes. yes. Uh, actually, I mean, in all this stuff about Jimmy Savile and everything else, you know, there was never, there was never anything like that. I'm straight, but uh, I have great many very great many gay friends. Worked with gay people. John obviously was gay, um, and you know, there was never anything untoward. Uh, not not in. Well, let's, okay. <laughs> well, there was never anything abusive, let us say, around John. Mm -hmm. um, he was, he was a, a lovely man. He gave me a break, and I'm grateful. But, Sam, I believe he snapped at you, telling you to mind your own business. Is that true? I can't remember. He said far worse things to me. <laughs> than mind your own business. Uh, particularly once we'd had a couple of drinks, which seemed to be most days. But um, no far worse. I, um, <laughs> But it was, we, we, we did have a row, actually. We had a row over, I can't remember what it was about. It was during the filming, and he, he thought I was interfering, I think, mm -hmm. which I wasn't. Um, but uh, he, he decided I was, and, um, uh, and I just, he annoyed, I didn't say anything, but I just looked at him to let him know that I was, I, I was very annoyed with him, and... Um, I mean, we'd known each other then for about three months. We, you know, we'd, we'd knock the corners off each other. And um, we parted. The next day, um, he said, um, he came up to me and he said uh, something very sensible. He said, shall we put yesterday behind us? 
and I said, yes. I thought that was, that's perfect. It's a phrase I've used with other people since, and I learnt that from John. Um, so I can't remember what it was about, but it was, it was um, intense for about 30 seconds. <laughs> um, you got to visit the location filming. Um, yeah. Is it us- usual for a writer to go to the location filming? <laughs> and also, yes. did you get paid extra for your cameos? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, excuse me, <coughs> my excuse is I get a bit dry in the throat. Um, I, I got to visit, I was there, I was there every day except one, actually. Um, and um, don't let me forget to tell you about the day I wasn't there. But, um, I, yeah, I was, I was there every day. Um, the reason I was there was because I was still fairly inexperienced. And I wanted to learn. I was trying to learn the, the trade, you know, and it's one thing sitting there um, in front of your new computer um, typing away and trying to envisage, envisage what um, your script being real. But quite another thing, when you're there with, you know, there's lights and cables everywhere and then an aeroplane goes over and, you know, things go wrong and Sylvester doesn't know his lines. And um, I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> um, well, he didn't, actually. Um, so, neither did Sophie. And um, <laughs> It's all coming out now. Not all of it. But <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, yeah, location, mm-hmm. location for me. And so I was there because I wanted to, mm-hmm. to learn what went on and how it went on. And, uh, what about so the day you weren't there, then? Thank you, yes. Uh, this brings us to Anton Differing. Um, can I talk a little yeah, about yeah, Anton Differing? Yes. Um, Anton, of course, no longer with us now for many, many years. Um, Chris Clough said to me in the office when they were doing the casting um, about the uh, the De Flores part, um, should we try and get Anton Differing? And, I mean, Anton had played every Nazi since the war. Um, he'd been in you know, virtually every war film ever made. He was always the one with the best costume. You know. But he had that, he had that incredible um, authority. And uh, particularly, uh, he never lost it. But you know, as a younger man, I mean, he, was, he was very good looking and he had those piercing blue eyes. Um, and he, he was, uh, you know, he'd been an actor all his life. Um, I started um, discovering films in the cinema and so on. When I was 10, and I, I was able to, when we moved to Birkenhead, and I was able to start going to see films on my own on Saturday afternoons, I always tried to go to war films because they were the most exciting. Anton was in virtually all of them. Um, so this was great, 1988, um, all these years later, so he's, he's going to be a silver nemesis. Um, and uh, he, I told him this one evening. I mean, Anton... Was he was difficult? Um, he was always complaining. Uh, he was. It was um, every time I think about that that uh, summer, I, I hear Anton's voice saying, "Give me, give me my part, my part." You know. <laughs> I won't tell you what I sometimes said, but it, it, I realised he was referring to the script. So uh, we we uh, we got over. It. And his part was never. Um, forgive me, this is getting terribly worse. It was never big enough for, uh, to, for Anton. Um, and there was always things wrong. And there were things, his costume was always problematic. And you know, all he did was complain. And I just decided um, that I, I didn't quite take him seriously. So um, I never really responded to any of this. He was sitting me down saying, no, look, you can't, you've got to give me, you've got to expand this scene because he doesn't explain what he means. You know, he's just trying to get more screen time. Um, and J and T would never have worn it anyway. J and T said, "I would just tell him to shut up." Well, I didn't quite like it anyway. So, um, so we we sort of got along like this for several days, and um, Anton was a bit of a pain. So we're staying in um, this hotel on the seafront in Worthing, and um, every night there was a bit of a drink up in the bar, you know, the crew and everything. Um, one evening, the one evening. Um, before the day I went away, Anton um, appeared in the bar. And, uh, you know, normally, you know, when you join a circle like that, it's, well, who wants a drink? Or, 
Anton just sort of stood there waiting to be. And uh, so I said, all right, Anton, come on, sit down. So I said, what do you have? And so I went and got him a drill. Oh, thank you, I'll have a marker. So I sat down. I said, right, now, now you're, um, I've bought you a drink. You're going to have to talk to me. I mean, our previous conversation several days before had, been, had ended with him saying, always you are smiling. <laughs> but you are terrible. I said, yes, I am terrible, yes. <laughs> so, uh, right. so, you know, now it's, um, what, what are you having, Anton? So, so there we are, so it's a half of a half log. So I said, right, now you, you've got to talk to me. So uh, uh, I suppose, sir, what are we going to talk about? So I said, well, um, tell me about how you started and the, as an actor, and what was it, you know, because obviously you were German, and being the age you are, it was the time you were a young man, it's Hitler, and so on. And uh, um, so he talked very interestingly about that and um, uh, his, his early life. And the first thing, actually, the first thing he said was, um, he said, well, of course, my father never wanted me to go into the theatre. Um, and I, I said, well, nobody's father wants him to go into the theatre, do they? I said, Christ, my father thought I'd gone mad when, um, uh, when I said I was going into the theatre. And I, I, said, uh, I said, without thinking, I, I said, in fact, my father um, thinks that I'm actually, for the first time, I'm doing quite well because I'm working with you. And he said, no. And, you know, in that instant, all that, all the the arrogance, all the front he put on for all those days just melted away you know, and the, the, you saw the, the vulnerable actor behind and, uh, and I, I said I'd, you know, it had come from the unconscious but it was true and I, I said yes it is true and I, so I, I said look when I, when I was 10 I went to see all these war films, you were in them all I said and uh, every time you came on the screen you frightened me I said you bloody well frighten me now <laughs> <laughs> So there we were, and, and so we became closer to each other. Now I have to tell you what happened next, um, which was that I, I, said, I said at the end of it, I said, right, I, I never got on with my father, but I, I wanted to uh, commemorate this moment with Anton, and I thought, um, I'll show the bugger, I'll send him a photograph of me with Anton, signed by Anton, you know. So I said, look, Anton, um, so, you know, we were talking earlier about this, so would you do this? And, would you have a photo taken with me? Oh, well, uh, yes, yeah, all right, I, I suppose that would be all right. Sir. So um, uh, I said, well, look, I've got to go back to London tomorrow, but I'm back on Thursday. So uh, I knew he'd got two more days, Thursday and Friday. So I, I said, well, have it done Thursday and Friday. I'll get them, I'll get them to do it. That's yes, all right. So that was that. I go back to London. I come back um, Thursday morning to find Anton had gone. Uh, he'd, they'd changed the schedule and they shot all his scenes and he'd gone. Um, and I, I obviously knew I wouldn't see him again. Um, and I felt very sad because we had, we had connected in that, in that little way. Now, several years later, I can't remember how many, maybe seven, um, yeah, I just have to ask you to believe this. I've got no proof of it. Um, this is what happened. About seven years, eight years later, uh, I woke up early one morning. It was about quarter to five in the morning. And um, in those days, I think Radio 3, which I listened to in the morning, started at five, and they start with the news. Now it's 24 hours. Um, and so I turned on Radio 3, and there was the news at five o'clock in the morning. And the last item was, the death has been announced of the actor Anton Differy. He was uh, 78 years old and he appeared in so on and so on. And I thought, 78, yes, well, well, you managed to get away with that, didn't you? <laughs> um, so uh, obviously I, I was very sad about this. Um, and no more was said. So I went over to Radio 4, where they have longer news, exactly the same uh, news as they'd done on Radio 3, a little bit expanded, no mention of Anton. So, um, again, I waited for 7 o'clock, obviously they put it on then. Same news, no mention of Anton. 8 o'clock, obviously there'll be some sort of mention then. No mention at all. Um, nothing in the press, nothing in the TV news. There was no other mention of his death in the news that I could find the whole of that day. 
The following morning, um, I, whatever it was, listened to the news, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. The last item was, the death has been announced of the actor Anton Diffring. And it was the same piece that I had heard the morning before that had not been repeated anywhere else. That's what happened. Don't tell me Doctor Who isn't a weird show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. There's some really nice, nice memories you've shared with us. Thank you. Um, was it JNT's idea to have the Cybermen? And did you come to the story with a sort of shopping list of things that you had to have in it? I, I wanted the Daleks, but um, Ben Aronovich had already got the Daleks. Um, so, uh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't really. In fact... Uh, I mean, I've never made a secret of that. I had never watched Doctor Who. Uh, when I was a child, my father wouldn't let me watch it on the grounds that uh, it would frighten me. I said to him later, look where that got you. Um, <laughs> and so I didn't, I didn't know very much about it. I didn't read science fiction. And, um, but I wanted to do it. I mean, I, I couldn't believe this opportunity had fallen into, in front of me. Uh, and I wanted to do it, I, so I, I watched all the Doctor Whos I, they could give me, which um, they were very few, most of them seemed to have, seemed to have disappeared. But, uh, so I didn't really know uh, who the Cybermen were. Uh, it was JNT who suggested it, because he wanted them because they were silver, and it was the silver, uh, obviously. Um, I was originally going to call the story Nemesis, um, because... Uh, that was what it was. Um, and John said, oh, well, as it's, we've got to make it silver. So it's silver nemesis. So silver nemesis it became. Um, I'm sure you all know, um, I'm sure you've all heard many times, the, uh, if not, um, I will confess it once again here. Um, I arrived in John Nathan Turner's office that morning with absolutely no idea what the story was going to be. Uh, I'd had a call the day before um, to say we're looking for the 25th anniversary um, Doctor Who and uh, I was out of work at the time and I, I said ah, oh, what an amazing coincidence I, yeah, fantastic. because I've got the perfect story um, so have you really well, we've, we've tried several people and it hasn't worked I said yep no I've got I've got absolute perfect story oh, marvellous come around 10 o'clock tomorrow morning 10 o'clock I'll be there I was awake most of the night. I mean, here I am. I hadn't seen Doctor I didn't really know much about Doctor Who. But I, you know, I, knew, I knew who the Doctor was. What he could do. But um, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a, an iota of a clue. And I left my flat, which was a few minutes' walk away. I walked around to Shepherd's Bush Green to uh, the office. Um, I go up in the lift, going up in the lift, I was really beginning to panic. I hadn't got a clue. I thought you were going to make you know, the biggest fool of yourself you've ever made. And uh, JNT uh, and the script editor were there and uh, we all sat down. And so uh, John said, um, right, so I, I gather you've, uh, you've got a very good idea for us. I said, yes, yes, I have. Um, and he said, well, what, what is it? So I said, Doctor Who? Uh, he said, yes. I said, the question I think we've all been asking ourselves for 25 years is, who is the Doctor? And then fortunately, I began to be able to see it. I, so who is the Doctor? Um, and then this idea of the nemesis immediately came because something had to happen. The Doctor had to come face to face with the person or the creature who knew his biggest secret. And his biggest secret is his identity. Who is he? So JNT said, who is he? And I said, as I've admitted many times, I said the first thing that came to mind, which was God. And he said, Christ. I said, no, God. <laughs> um, so I, he, said, he said, oh, well, uh, and the more, the, this idea began to grow on me. And you know, I, I began to, I said, yes, he's God. I, and I began to base him on myself. I, I have a very bad memory. Um, so I said, yes. And so what happened is, you see, he's, 
25 years ago, he forgot to do something. And now it's going to destroy the world. You know, God is imperfect. I don't believe in God, but God is imperfect. God, um, he comes among us and he gets it wrong. He's not a perfect God. He's like one of the Greek gods. You know, he messes it up. Oh, he said, you can do it, but you mustn't say it. So before we finish, so 25 years ago, you had the idea of asking the question, Doctor Who? Who is he? Hmm. Does that sound familiar, guys? <laughs>